Welcome to the Boardroom Sessions podcast with your host, Mike Miller. In these sessions, we get to meet up close and personal with the best and the brightest technology leaders and executives in Southern California. We learn about their backgrounds, their business models, and their challenges. We learn about their goals and what makes them tick. Hope you enjoy. In this podcast session, we meet Dave Rhodes, founder and CEO of Blue Street Capital. I've known Dave as a close personal friend for more than 25 years. Dave is a very successful entrepreneur, business leader, father and husband, and a hard charging surfer. Now let's meet Dave Rhodes. Dave Rhodes, welcome to the Boardroom Sessions podcast. How are you? Thanks, my brother. Thanks for having me, man. Great. So you're the CEO and founder of Blue Street Capital. Tell, I us, am. About, tell us about Blue Street. You bet. We're uh, we're in the technology financing space. We're we're in the equipment leasing industry. We finance a lot of the cloud infrastructure, servers, routers, security software. You know, we're financing a lot more of uh, licenses, AWS, Microsoft Azure, uh, Salesforce. So our business has been uh, been changing quite a bit, but it's uh, it's going gangbusters. Things are going really well. How many guys do you have? There's 13 of us all together. 13, 13 yep. employees. Yep. And uh, the majority of those employees are out, out selling. They're finding new clients and they're uh, finding new opportunities. Everybody sells. Everybody sells. <laughs> Everybody in the company sells. We're, we're uh, infrastructure. You know, our, our business is about 50-50. We have half in sales. And uh, I have myself and my partner. You know, I, I'm the CEO. He's the president. He handles more of our uh, credits and bankings. And um, he does uh, actually works on the sales side quite a bit. And then uh, the rest is operations support, right, That which is our product, which we have a pretty strong team there as well. Great. Yeah, I've come in your office uh, many a time and heard heard the boiler room, heard lots of conversations going on with lots of different folks. Some standing while they're talking, uh, trying to create some emotion. Motion creates emotion. You no, know, yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting when you have it. Just it builds energy. It feeds. It's it's great. This is the you know, last couple of years we've developed uh, uh, more of a remote workforce too, or some we have some salespeople. Uh, Got a spectacular guy in Boston, a uh, couple guys in Dallas are doing a great job. And, and one of our best uh, sales and longest salespeople, he's out in the Southeast. So that's been interesting. We, we've actually, it's, it's been working out really well. So we, we plan to expand that model a little bit more. Interesting model in the fact that you found a niche within the the VAR space, if you will, the VAR yeah. resellers, yeah. the folks mm-hmm. that are selling the, the traditional IT infrastructure. I remember originally you had dabbled in some restaurant equipment and other kinds of, of services, but to find a niche, that's powerful. Yeah. You know, when I started the company, I already had a strong technology focus going back to, you know, the internet pops were all over the place and kind of the uh, late nineties, you know, three com gear, this uh, up and coming company called Cisco. I don't know if you've heard of them before. Yeah. yeah and so, uh, you know, as we evolved as a business, we always had a strong focus in tech, but that wasn't our only focus. And probably about six or seven years ago, we made a cut over to all we're going to do is technology. That's that's going to be our go-to-market. That's where we're going to get really good, and and uh, and, and uh, that's that's worked out pretty well. Pretty well. There's a lot of competition in our space, like any space, but we do our best to try to differentiate from from the big boys. So, how are you trying to stay ahead of the pack and the fact that the traditional IT infrastructure stack is shrinking? Most folks are leaning toward cloud-related services, software as a service, technologies that are originating in a data center from a, a larger company. Are you how are you shifting to find those clients? You know, as, as I said at the beginning, we're, we're starting to see, we, we've already been doing it. We've been financing software licenses for a long time. So so we have been financing cloud applications. Um, but really, even though a lot of the stack is moving to the cloud, we're financing a lot of the companies that are providing cloud services, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of media companies we were working with. Uh, yeah, we just did this great deal with Warner Brothers at the end of the year. Um, they, they need their own cloud, right? And so... Um, you know, Salesforce is kind of a big example, but they need massive, massive in- infrastructure. And Salesforce, they finance all their equipment, right? They, they equipment lease. Well, I wouldn't say all of it, but that's part of their CFO strategy. So, Right. That's awesome. Because the infrastructure in the uh, companies that we deal with here in Orange County, for example, even though their infrastructure footprint is shrinking, the providers that they're going to use infrastructure footprint is increasing. So you're just following... The trend, you're yeah. ahead of it and working with yeah. the, I mean, the Silicon the, Valley the, folks and, and everyone. Exactly, exactly. The up-and-comers, uh, 
you know, uh, Ring Central, who you're very familiar with, right? Maybe, maybe not that company, but companies like them, they, they need massive infrastructure to grow. And generally, they're doing it through financing modes. Awesome. That's creative. I like it. So, Dave, you started your career as a rep in this industry. And um, as a father and a newly married you know, husband, you decided to take the leap of faith and start your own start your own company right. and be your own boss. That's a that's a big proposition. How uh, walk us through how you made that that shift? Yeah, yeah, you bet. Well, a co- couple things come to mind is is from the beginning, I was a hundred percent commission. I, I think uh, you and I have talked about this, but uh, I remember going into the company I was at the time, and and uh, the owner of the company basically said, "Hey, I'll." I'll give you a draw here for a thousand bucks for the next couple months. And by the way, you can have that seat in the conference room and, uh, you know, handed me a list, the old, uh, IBM green and white print sheet that clearly had been worked over the pretty green, good. The green said, bar, we call said, those. Hey, yeah. this is kind of a good one. Go at it. And, you know, I, I had some pretty good coaching there, but it was, it was more, uh, kind of feed to the wolves type coaching. And I would, got promoted up out of the conference room into a cubicle and, you know, worked my way up through the organization. Um, I, I helped them build a, uh, an office uh, up in Northern California, which was a great experience. And, in in uh, Lake Tahoe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I got to live in Lake Tahoe and be, uh, be a professional, but be a ski bum at the same time. And, and uh, that kind of was pretty instrumental in, in thinking and in knowing that I could uh, start Blue Street because culture was such a key piece when I moved up to Tahoe. You know, we're down here in Southern California. You know, people were still in ties all the time back in the late 90s. And you go up to Tahoe and there's guys in shorts. There's people uh, in the summertime jumping in the lake at lunch. There's Dogs on uh, the floor. Yeah, I mean, and if it's a powder day, right? people are gone. Right. I but, remember coming and seeing dogs in the office and guys yep. walking around and thought, yep. what's yep. going on here? How yeah. can you get any work done? Yeah. Yeah, but it's so anyway, quite, quite the opposite, right? Yeah, to a certain extent, people are more. Uh, they're, they, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in balance, and uh, you know, balance in Tahoe definitely weighed more towards you know having fun and and you know getting the powder when it's good or uh, you know wakeboarding when the lake's flat in the morning. It's I, I love it, man. I mean, it's you know charging on the mountain bikes. It's it's such a killer lifestyle up there. So so you were being very successful at that role. How did you then decide to come back down to Southern California and give it a go at your at your own company? Yeah, my uh, uh, my wife Lisa became pregnant, and we knew that we wanted to be back down near family. And you know, there's a certain extent I wanted to be that back down near the beach and the ocean. And we just had a huge network here. We had you know friends friends uh, friends like the Millers down here that we wanted to be near when we raised the family. So. Fantastic. We all know how that turned out. Dave's a uh, avid surfer, paddleboarder adventurer and uh, beach guy. So Dave, let's talk about Blue Street. So you decided that uh, you would open up your own your shop and take that leap. What was the thought process when you decided to do that? Well, I remember when I moved back from Tahoe to uh, Irvine, you know, I was going back into a traditional office environment and thinking um, this, is, this isn't going to work too well. Just because I was so in that mode of you know, coming into work uh, in shorts and flip flops and being able to do all these cool things at lunch. And not that I couldn't do that there, I, I could have. It just, I, I felt like I needed a greater sense of uh, freedom, right? I kind of joked around as soon as I got married and had a kid and then was working for somebody, I needed to free up, <laughs> free up my uh, control a little bit. And then also, I, I remember going to, uh, and he's still my buddy, my boss at the time, and, and uh, um, saying, hey, I, I just, it's growth. Right. I don't see that I can grow here beyond where I where I am. I'm not going to be an owner. And uh, yeah, I'm super grateful for the experience there. It was just it was it's totally growth focus. I wanted to be able to grow. So how long did it take you to start feeling comfortable that you had found your groove uh, with Blue Street? Yes. I've never found it. Never found your groove. You still don't feel comfortable. <laughs> I had this killer mentor. She she uh, she ran Ikea, Pernella. Uh, she ran Ikea for about 12, 14 years. She was, she was president here. And I, I just remember going into her before we were going to have an offsite and she was going to, and, and our revenue wasn't great. And she looked at me and she goes, Dave, I, in all of my years in business, there has never been a year uh, where there hasn't been some major catastrophe or some kind of challenge. And, and that's just, that's just business. So yeah, it, it, it never changes. You know, there's always, there's always something going on, whether it's HR or revenue or uh, something there's, there's always, but that's, there's always some challenge to overcome. Always. always right? Yeah. Which but is, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Right. You work really hard on culture 
at mm-hmm. Blue Street. And I know that's very important to you. I've come in and we've had conversations around how to uh, run a sales team and how to develop sales plans yep. and yep. You know, inspection and um, things of that nature. But you always lean on the tendency to care more about uh, how the environment set up for your people. Talk to me about your overarching strategy, and then we're going to dive into something I think the, the listeners here want to hear about. Well, as as a business, uh, one of our values is to really create massive value for everybody, right? So whether that's our uh, partners, whether it's our employees, whether it's our customers, uh, we always are talking about how we how we create amazing not just 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 value but amazing value right how do, what are we doing different than everybody else and and that to me that ties in with having a cool office environment having a so my president always says a collegial environment everybody's there's there's no dicks here yeah right we so describe the office environment it's casual um people, people are going out to see customers we're uh we probably do more meetings than we need to, but we're, we're always meeting. It's, it's very collaborative. Even our salespeople are, you know, highly, highly commissioned. I mean, these guys are helping each other. You know, they're not hugging deals. They're, we, we had, we've had people come through the business where it's all about me, 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 me. And in order for us to truly grow that business and scale the business, we, we needed to kind of get rid of those people. And, you know, good people, great producers, but what we were trying to accomplish here was, was more of a team than anything. So so recently, Dave, you've deployed a five-hour workday. Mm-hmm. Tell us about where that concept came from. It was a stroke of luck. We, uh, you know, one of our track of customers, our CFOs, you know, technology companies, and I was reading CFO magazine and, you know, probably towards the back of the magazine and the back corner of a magazine, I saw a little article about a company that had moved to the five-hour workday. It was a paddleboard company, right? Stand-up paddleboard company. They were on Shark Tank. Mark Cuban invested in them. And uh, so I caught that blurb, and then I dug in a little bit online. Uh, the guy had wrote a uh, uh, book on it, uh, Stephen Aristotle. That was that was really interesting. Um, but right away, I'm like, that's, you know, and, and kind of looking at how we function as a business, I'm like, this, this could, this is perfect, right? So I brought it up to my president. He looked at me like I was fucking crazy. You know, he went home that night, came in the next day, and he's like, this is the greatest idea we've ever had. And so walk me through a five-hour workday. I mean, how did you deploy that? How did you come into work one day, pull the team into a team meeting, and say, this is what we're going to do? It was really confusion. You know, people didn't uh, get it. Uh, but really, what, what made sense about it to, to us, right, and it's not applicable to every business, is eight, nine-hour workday was invented in 1914 by Henry Ford for line workers, right? And so, to me, we're in this information age or whatever the next age is, and we're working in an industrial age model. So, my gamble was if we get everybody here and super focus eight to one, right, limited, limited breaks, if any at all, uh, no lunch, no water cooler chit chat. Everybody gets that real solid focus time uh, for that five hours. We weren't that far off of really being the amount of work time in our eight hour day. So that's the framework. It's eight to one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Limited at breaks. Mm-hmm. No official one hour lunch, which turns to an hour and a half often. Right. Right. And you the goal is to get everybody to put in a solid grind it out five hours of their best production. Right. And. What I underestimated was we really had to change the values of the business and the culture of the business for the time we were here, which which is uh, we're still working on it. It's not easy. So, for example, uh, a guy that had worked here, he wasn't working, <clears throat> not here anymore, but it's nine, nine fifteen in the morning. And I go into the restroom and the dude's in there cleaning his goldfish bowl. <laughs> So, needless to say, he's not with us anymore. But the five-hour workday, you don't have time to go clean your goldfish no, bowl. No, no, you need to put in your production. Yeah. So, what happens yeah. when I come by your office at two thirty or what have you, and uh, there's many folks still here uh, banging on the phones? That that was my other thought. Is people don't stop working, uh, especially people that love what they do, especially people that really want to be successful. Is you know, we're given this focus time from eight to one. What they do after that is totally up to them. Nobody's batting an eye if they leave if you're at 101. If they want to stay till 10 at night, they're more than welcome to. Yeah. But the producers, the people want to be successful, they don't turn it off. No. Right. In the shower, they're working. No, we're always right? working. So it's no longer a work life yeah, uh, yeah. balance, it's a work life blend. Right. That's a, that's a quote from one of my favorite CIOs. Oh, really? He says that all the time. And it's actually accurate. 
as you and I know, we're texting each other all hours of the mm-hmm. day and night. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not even one of your clients. Yeah. And so that being said, I'm certain that everyone on your team who's motivated is doing the same thing. It's just the way business is done today. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. So you were a metrics guy. So like all good CEOs, you measure and inspect production. And right. so tell us about how the measurements have been pre the five hour workday and post. We started it in uh, 16 and 17. We were, we were up approximately 15% over 16. And uh, right now in 18, we're, we're only in Q1, coming at Q1, but we're already, uh, you know, we're already going to be 30% of our head of our number last year. Awesome. Do you measure any kind of productivity tools with your guys as far as number of of deals open and calls and things of that nature pre and post. Yeah, we're su- we're super focused on a uh, number of opportunities they create, qualified opportunities. So that that's kind of our baseline metric. Outside of that, if the opportunities aren't being created, we're looking at their calls pretty heavily. But we kind of move up the chain, right? You know, calls, meetings, getting in front of people, doing what you should be doing. And then what generates out of that? And then, of course, you know, what, what we win out of that. So so being a, an individual that is in front of a lot of big companies with big company cultures and mentality, um, I get to see a lot of the different methodologies used for inspection. Yeah. One of the things I always find interesting about Dave is that you have a tendency to want to hire right off the bat. The individual who's self-motivated, mm-hmm. has yeah. a fire in the belly, has intention. Tell us about how you find that individual versus some philosophies are to hire people with the right background and then train them into the mold of uh, their system. So you, it's a very different, you, you're looking for a unique individual. I'm looking for a bunch of Mike Millers. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I, uh, I, and uh, I, I have fucked this up more times and we've hired wrong so many times uh, I can't even begin to tell you. And, and you'd like to think we have it right by now. I, I'd like to think we've gotten a lot better at it, you know, especially uh, not only keeping performers, but keeping people that are in our culture, you know, people that don't blow our culture up or, you know, come into the office and they're just, you know, the big baby or having a bad day. So, um, but to, I, I don't know the exact model to find performers. We have a pretty set hiring process that we've modeled off a. Of, one of the best companies in our business, I always call my mentor company, um, you know, where we have a six, seven step uh, interview process. And we'd like to think that weeds out. And even if it still doesn't, we've gotten really good at moving on the non-performers uh, faster. Right. Um, Jack Welch philosophy, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Your bottom 80% early and often. We try. We're a small business. It's painful for us when we get it wrong, you know, because it's a big investment. But that's just that's that's part of the process. Awesome. So, so Dave, you mentioned a couple times in this uh, conversation mentors. Yeah. So you're a grower, uh, a growth oriented individual. You're a seeker. You've had uh, mentor groups that you've been a part of. You have mentors that you follow and that actually are formally a part of your business. Tell us about how you got started in that and when you felt you needed that and what you've learned along the way of, of using mentors in your business. I have some of the best mentors I could ever imagine right now. It's it's really really cool. I talked about Pernella uh, earlier, uh, Lopez. She she she's been amazing for me. And then I've been really really fortunate as well to work with uh, uh, a guy by the name of Tony Golobic. He's he's a CEO of a company called Great America. They have two billion in portfolio, and he and his team you know built this company from scratch in a uh, I wouldn't say a short amount of time. They're out of Cedar Rapids and. Uh, you know, so I've been fortunate enough to spend some time with him over the last uh, year or so. And How did you find him? Well, we, we they're one of our partners. We, we work with them on a number of fronts. And uh, I, I was talking with somebody in their business, and I, I had actually just asked her straight out. I said, does Tony ever do any mentoring? And, and uh, I, uh, Sally Browsey had, you know, set, set me up with them. So. so these are formal business partners that you found uh, that had skill sets and knowledge that you wanted to impart on you. Yeah. And you yeah, sought yeah, them out yeah. in a formal format right. and said, would you mentor me? Exactly. Yeah. That's unique. I, I wish I would have done it early on. It's something I just started doing the last three, four years. I, I'd had informal ones before or business coaches I've actually paid for. But frankly, uh, you know, the people I've gained the most knowledge from are people who are more than willing to give up a few hours 
you know, of their time to help and, you know, get somebody to the, maybe the place they were, or learn something that they had to learn the hard way. So look to people who have what you want and then ask them to help. Dude, success leaves clues. That's right. Tony Robbins, success That's leaves clues. It's a model and it's just amazing. You how used how a giving, group. how did, giving did they you are. Did you use a group at one point? Weren't you in Vestige? Yeah, I was in uh, uh, Vestige. Vestige. It was a CEO peer group for right. about five or six years and, and, uh, learned an amazing amount uh, about running a business. When I started this business, I didn't know how to run a business. Um, I'm pretty sure I still don't, but, but they, they, they helped out a lot. Uh, amazing people I met there. Um, you know, it was, it was a great experience. And so Dave, you're a big uh, reader. You're mm-hmm. always reading books and yeah. passing books back and forth yep. with me. Yep. You um, big podcast junkie. Um, part of the reason Total why we're junkie. sitting here right now having yeah. a podcast yep. today. Yep. Um, and tell us about that. How did that whole journey start for you? The amount of information that's out there that is free and that we can get is, is just, it's, it's incredible. You know, it's, it's so incredible. I think anybody that's missing out on that is, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to me. So yeah, I'm total podcast junkie, probably junkie doesn't even define it properly. I love, 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 love listening to people and listening to new ideas and, and finding new stuff out there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, books. I have three, four books going at any given time. And usually I try to have a spread between a business book, uh, you know, a, a really good, uh, you know, story, nonfiction type book. So Great. So one of the things that most people don't get from you after they know you mm-hmm. um, is that you're a Connecticut kid. Yeah. So you grew up in Connecticut. I grew up, yeah. You went to yeah. college in Arizona. Yep. But yet you're one of the hardest core surfers I know in Huntington Beach. You fit the beach mold better than most folks I know and you're a transplant. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Well, first of all, I, I pretty much have uh, you to blame and our buddy Drew to blame for that. So, but yeah, I, I grew up in a uh, cool uh, small town, Beth- Bethel, Connecticut. Um, one of the, one, I think as a kid, it was probably one of the best places you could grow up. I think, you know, some people might argue with that, but it's uh, it was a cool small town, no, nowhere near the ocean, nowhere near the beach. We had to drive 45 minutes to go to the Long Island Sound and, you know, jump in the, jump in the waves there where you got to look out for syringes sometimes. But, Brutal. But I always loved the water. It didn't matter if it was a lake, a pool, or a beach. As a kid, it was just, I always, always, always loved it so i went to school in arizona and then when i came out here and uh, i i still remember coming down the hill on superior in newport beach and seeing that neighborhood there and looking at it and going gosh how how amazing would it be to live there and you know oh the peninsula the peninsula yeah <laughs> and then you know 10 years later i'm living there i'm, I'm ingrained in the lifestyle and you know i had the opportunity to surf every day um you know it was uh it was just it was everything i could ever dreamed of and you've made your entire life built around surfing. Yeah, which, I did. Yeah, and, and the beach yep. life. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm glad my wife is tolerant of it to a certain degree, but yeah, it really, you know, from the name of the company, Blue Blue Street Capital, Blue Ocean. I love the ocean. It, that's had everything to do with the name. We're in your conference room, in your in your boardroom, in our, in our boardroom, in Huntington Beach, overlooking Huntington High School. That's right. Yeah. I'm um, right here on a sunny morning. Getting the surf, it's a mile away. Yep. So I, I get it, and I, uh, I respect that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dave, what wisdom would you impart on others that are looking to start their own business? Folks that are maybe very successful at what they're doing in a, in a sales role. Mm-hmm. Um, what wisdom would you impart on them as they consider the journey to entrepreneurship? Yeah. Anybody that's super successful has already started their own business a long time ago. So. You're, you're a perfect example, Mike. It's You work for this killer company, but you clearly see it as your own business, right? And that's part of the reason why you've been super successful and, and really can bring a lot of value and help a lot of people in the marketplace. So I guess one is you are, you do run your own business right now, whether you think you do or not. Um, two, if you don't think you do, you need to take that mentality. And then uh, three, I, I, I love, uh, you taught me this is, how can I help? Right. Always asking, how can I help? What value can I bring? Not what deal can I do? How can I how can I get get get? It's like if you walk into a room and you you have the mentality of how I can help. To me, that is the best mindset you could have to have in your own business and being being your own CEO, so to speak. It's a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a purpose and a value statement that if uh, if you lead with, it's life changing. Yep. No doubt. Yep. No doubt. Um, Dave, when I look at you and talk to you about uh, the journey, 
I, uh, I look back at, uh, I've known you for 25 years now, I think. And um, to see the fact that on a regular basis, you tell me, uh, should have done this earlier, couldn't have, couldn't have got out earlier or could have got out earlier. That just tells me to, I, I want to impart that on most of the world, that risk, you know, risk is there, but there's reward. Right. And we live in a different economy today mm -hmm. than we've ever lived in before. Yeah. Meaning that there's more tools available to you to work from home, to do what you need to do, to work from anywhere, create anything. And that the, the big corporate company structure is not for everyone and that there's a risk to be taken and there's a reward to be reaped. Yeah. Right. I really feel like the risk is not doing it right. The, the risk is staying where you are. And as soon as you get that mindset, that's that's when stuff starts to change pretty quick. That's it. That's it. So on that note, Dave, we're uh, going to keep this one short. I appreciate the time with you today and I uh, look forward to many more workouts in the morning and good luck to you in Blue Street. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me. Hey, Mike here. Hope you like this boardroom session. Please check back to your future sessions as we're recording a new one every month. If you want to reach out, look for me on LinkedIn or send me a note at mike at sidepath.com. That's mike at S-I-D-E-P-A-T-H dot com.